Okay, hi everyone. So nice to have you all here. I'm very happy to be presenting a little bit what we do at Hugging Face and, and uh, also the more important is uh, answering your question at the end. So I usually do this talk with uh, first uh, a presentation, some slides uh, where I will cover transfer learning in NLP. If you don't know it, you will have this, this background after that. Then I talk about the limits of transfer learning, where the, where the field is heading. And then uh, in the second part, I talk about hugging face and the tools we developed. And then the last part is more about the uh, beginning of a hands-on. So I will show you the, the main resources, the best place to start to, to learn how to use our tools. And then the idea is that you may have some questions and I will show you more resources which are related to more the, the question you asked me okay because we have a lot of things <laughs> i have a lot of things i could show you so the best is then uh, then to hand on the microphone to you to tell me what are the most important topic to you but first let's start with the slides we have about uh, half an hour so that's perfect and i'll start by talking about what is transfer learning okay let's go so what is transfer learning very good question uh, the transfer learning is something that is um, kind of another way to train machine learning models. So this is the traditional way we used to train model for, for a long time. So we were, when, we, when we had a task in mind, we, we gather some data on this task, we, we build a, da a data set, and then we will randomly initialize our model from scratch usually and train it on this data. Then we get the, the system we use for, for our prediction, for instance, in production. Now, when we have another task, usually we randomly initialize the model from scratch again. We have another set of data points that we've gathered on this new task, and we train a new model on, on this new task, okay? But we usually consider them as separate models. And if we have a third task, we will do the same process again. Gather some data, build a data set, randomly initialize the model, train it on a data set and open and, and get the, the machine learning system we, we use for prediction. Now, that's not really how humans learn. We human, we don't randomly initialize our brain from scratch each time we, we face, uh, we're faced with a new task. We use what we call knowledge, which is kind of a digest of all the data points, all the tasks we've been faced with in our life. And we use this as a starting point to tackle a new task that we see, okay? And there is two main advantages of starting from this, this kind of knowledge. Is the, the first one is that we can learn with just a very few number of examples. So uh, we can learn humans, you can just give them usually just one or two examples of a new task and they, and they get the ID, if you want. We can say the ID. They, what, what this means is that they can connect this to all their knowledge and they can generalize or, 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 um, around the data points that you provide to understand basically to what is the underlying task, the underlying meaning of the task, okay? So this is the first advantage. We are very data efficient because we can rely on, the, on this knowledge base. And the second advantage is that we usually reach better performances. And the reason is the same, is that because we have a lot of uh, knowledge, we can generalize, we can basically fill the, the gaps between the data points here, and we can reach better performances, okay? So transfer learning is one way to try to do that for machine learning system as well. So I took these this images from this nice paper by Pan and Yang in 2010. And uh, if you want more information, last summer we gave, uh, with uh, Sebastian Ruder, Swoba <coughs> and Matthew, uh, we gave uh, a nice tutorial at, uh, at NACL, which was a three, three hour tutorial on transfer learning in NLP with code exercise, 100 examples, so this is a good resource if you want to learn more about it than, um, than what I will be able to tell you today, okay? So there are various ways we can do transfer learning, but the way um, I will focus today is called sequential transfer learning. So it's called sequential transfer learning because you're doing a sequence of tasks. So you have at least two tasks to make a sequence. The first task is, is usually called pre-training. And the second task is called adaptation or fine tuning. You have various ways to call that, but that's the idea. These tasks are quite different, these two, these, two, these two steps. The first step is very computationally intensive because in these steps, you will try to build the knowledge base I was talking about in the previous slide, okay? So you will try to gather as much data as you can 
you will try to build the biggest corpora that you can basically to uh, mimic like a life experience if you want okay and you will train the model so that you obtain a general purpose model that you can use them to tackle many downstream tasks so you've probably heard about many of these uh, general purpose model the early ones were these words embeddings word to vec glovi and then since uh, since skip thought actually um, we've started to use fully pre-trained model where we don't just share the first embedding matrix like like in word to vec or glovi but we we share and, and use as starting point the full pre-trained model so you see the, the the names you know i guess gpt bird distilled bird if you've been in a, in working in AI, you've probably heard about this name. So these are general purpose models, which means they are not really specifically designed for one specific task. They can be used for many tasks. So there is this second step of adaptation where we will try to adapt the model to our specific task. But I, I'll first start by showing you a little bit what's happening in pre-training. So pre-training has seen recently the rise of what we call language modeling. So there are many ways we can pre-train and the, the most successful currently, the most successful training objectives currently are based on language modeling, which means you will try to predict the text itself. So you take a corpus of text and you try to maximize the probability of the words taken as token in your vocabulary. So the probability of the text here, it can be, for instance, decomposed as the product of the probability of tokens or the product of the probability of the words. And then you just try to maximize the probability of the words given the context, if you want. Okay? This is just the, the basic chain rule that you, that you write here. So given, for instance, the beginning of the sentence, you will try to maximize the probability of the right next token. This is causal or autoregressive language modeling. So the, the nice thing about this objective is that it is self-supervised. You use the data itself as the labels. So you don't have to do human annotation. And this is really great because it means we can scale to a very large data set with, with a cost which is, a, which is a reasonable, basically. Uh, so in many languages, we actually have enough texts on the internet to train a high capacity model. Okay, this is, this is really very nice. Now we need to filter this text to keep the good quality text. And we have some issues actually from the data and biases, but at least we have a lot of data. We have a lot of data, which is, which is really great. And this objectives here is also very versatile. As I told you, you can decompose it as the product of the words given the context, or you can also rewrite it as a denoising objective, like masking one, one token and predicting the probability, maximizing the probability of this mass token. So you have many ways you can reformulate or approximate these um, objectives, which people are currently exploring to find the one that leads to the most general purpose representation. Okay, so this is the loss. This is the objective we're trying to maximize. And now a little word about the models, because today's models are mostly this. May, most of these um, landscape pre-trained models are transformers. The reason is mostly that they are more efficient in terms of computation given given the computational budget you can actually um, train models on more data with a, with a transformer uh, because they are more parallel than the previous architecture which were mostly the, the rnn and the lstm in the deep learning world so i show you a little bit how a transformer works this is quite a higher level overview but yeah i think it's good to fix the idea so this is how we train a bird model. So we take a sentence, my dog is a good boy, for instance. So you can see this is typical internet sentence, okay? And you will mask one word. So here, for instance, we'll mask the verb, we'll mask is and replace it with a mask token, okay? Now our models, they can't really ingest strings. So we have to convert that to uh, numbers. So the way we do that is that we first convert these, these tokens in integers in our vocabulary. And then we have a matrix of embeddings, which associate to each word in vocabulary a fixed length um, vector. Okay, so here we have the vector associated to each word. So as you can see, they don't depend on the context. Here, the words, the vector associated to dog, does not depend on the right on the left context. But we would like them to depend. Okay, so that the vector associated to mask here can be influenced by the context to go closer to the real vector we would like, which is the word is. So the way we do that is that we use attention. 
So attention, the attention mechanism in the transformer is a bit like a weighted average. So basically here, the token, as the vector associated to mask will be replaced by a weighted average of the left and the right vectors, okay? The left and the right contexts. So we do that for each token. And then we have also a non-linearity, okay? We need that to get a, a neural network, otherwise it just all falls back to a linear matrix product, basically. And so we have several times this, these two things, attention plus non-linearity, okay? And at the end, we also have, we, we, we still have these vectors that we call hidden states, but now they depend on the context, okay? The vector associated to, to the hypercolumn where we have, where we started with mask, now depends on the left and the right context. So we can just project them back on the vocabulary with basically the transposed of the, of the input embeddings, and we get a um, probability of a class in our vocabulary. And we just have a label, which is the correct token. Okay, this is the token that was masked here. And we want the model basically to predict this token. So we do just a cross entropy with this label. Okay, so this is one way to train model. This is how we train BERT. Now there is another way to train these models, which is called usually the autoregressive way or the causal language modeling way, okay? This is the way we trade models in the GPT family, for instance, like OpenAI has been on mostly, very, pretty much only using this way of training, while Google and Facebook use sometimes, well, I mean, it's not really a matter of companies anyway, but this is the GPT uh, family, okay? And this is the autoregressive way. So it's look kind of the same as you can see, but there is one difference is that um, when you start with one word here at the beginning of a hyper column, at the end of the hyper column, you will try to predict the next word. Okay, so my dog, after dog, will try to predict is. So we have to do a little bit of um, modification to the attention mechanism, okay? We have to actually uh, mask the right context. Here you can see the attention is only um, performed on the left context. It's different than this, this side because otherwise we can the model can just see that the next token is is and there is just no difficulty to this task. Okay, so these models they are inherently less powerful because they cannot use the right context to predict the word. Okay, but the good thing is that they have a lot more training signal. Huh? Here you can see we have one training label for each token. While in a BERT model, we can only mask a few words, otherwise we don't have enough context to guess. If we mask everything here, the model has no context to try to guess anything, okay? So we have a trade-off between how much token we mask and how much training signal we had. So typically, um, uh, autoregressive models will train like two to four times faster because it has more, more training signal, okay? So this is the models. And you've seen also the, um, the training. So now we've seen what, you, what we do during the pre-train. Now the second step is the adaptation or fine-tuning step. So how does it work? Um, <clears throat> I will show you in the next slide, but here I show you again the two main benefits that we uh, hope to get, which is first to have a data efficient step. Okay, we hope that we will be able to get good performances with just a few examples which as we know all is always difficult in the deep learning world, okay? Our models are always hungry. But here we hope we'll be very data efficient and we hope we reach higher performances as well. Okay, this is the two, the two strategies. So how do we do that? How do we adapt this pre-trained model to uh, our downstream task? Well, here I show you a few examples of downstream tasks. Can be, for instance, text. I'll just give you two main examples in the next slide. So the first one will be about text classification. So text classification is quite easy. For instance, let's say you have a number of tweets that come in, and you want to classify them as positive emotion tweets or like negative uh, sentimental tweets. Yeah. Okay. Is it positive and negative tweets, for instance? Or it can be word labeling. Another word for word labeling is called name entity recognition or token classification. These are all kind of the same class where we try to assign a label to each word or each token. So this can be useful, for instance, if you want to you have a news articles and you want to highlight the name of actors or the name of companies, you want to extract them, you will do some word labeling, okay? And here is another uh, example of a uh, task, which is question answering. This can be abstractive or extractive, but basically you have some, some knowledge base, which can be also just the model, but you have some knowledge base and given a question, you will try to 
uh, given answer. Okay, so how do you do the adaptation in practice? Well, it's pretty easy. The first step will be to remove the pre-training task head. So in our case, this was the pink boxes at the top. You remember this projection back to the vocabulary? Now we don't need that anymore because this was used just for pre-training, so we remove them unless we have exactly the same target task. Huh? If our target task is to predict mass to word, then we just can just keep them. But usually our target task is quite different from the pre-training task, so we will remove the pre-training head and we will replace it with something that can be very simple. It can be just a, a linear projection from the hidden state down to the number of class, or it can be more complex. Sometimes we kind of freeze the whole model because we do like semantic parsing or something very different from the pre-training task and we had we add a full LSTM on top of stuff. Sometimes the task is even structurally different. Like you remember in the pre-training, we had a single input sentence. Huh? My, my dog is a good boy. And sometime in the downstream task, we have several type of inputs. So I will show you that in details later. But in this case, there is a question, how do you handle several type of inputs? So you can, one option that I illustrate here is to duplicate your model. Then you connect them together with course attention or a way to connect them together. And you use Ill, each duplicated models to process one type of input. This is one possibility. So I want to show you two very practical examples so you see how it works really. The first one is a uh, text classification as I was mentioning. And here I will show you the whole pipeline. So let's say we have this task. This task, we have a string as input. Here it's Jim Hansen was a puppeter. And the task is to predict the classification, is to predict if the input string is true or false. Let's say it's kind of a fact, a fact checker, okay? This is kind of a toy example, obviously, but yeah, it's to show you how it works. So the first step will be tokenization. Tokenization is a little bit different, is, I mean, a little bit smart in these models because they are made to be able to process open domain vocabulary. They are made to be able to process huge corpus of data. And so they will meet some words which are rare. They will meet some words which are badly written with typo. They will meet every type of um, weird thing that we can encounter on the, on the internet or in books or everywhere. And so we need a way to handle very open vocabulary, if you want, okay? So here, for instance, perpetrator is a rare word. We don't see that very often. So do we want that in our vocabulary? Do we want to have a full embeddings that we will need to train for the word perpetrator? Not really. So what we do is that for this rare word, we will split them. Split them in suffix, prefix, until we know each part. And it can go down to split them in just single letters, just because uh, it's, for instance, a full typo that we have never seen anywhere. In this case, we will split them. But there is a single unit that we usually always know. Once they are split, when here, for instance, er is quite a common suffix, so it's in our vocabulary. Puppet is also quite common is in our vocabulary, so now everything is, on our, is in our vocabulary. Vocabulary for bird is like, for instance, 50,000 words, something like that, so we, we still have a lot of room. Then we convert them in indices in our vocabulary, and we're ready to plug the transformer model we saw before, okay? So as you remember, this transformer model outputted some vectors at the end, which depended on the context. And now we want to down to project this in two classes. So we will do, we will have a classifier model, which is just, for instance, just a linear classifier. Here, for instance, what we can do is just pull all these vectors together, like the, the average, the max pooling, for instance. Then we have a single vector. And here we just have a linear layer which project back from the dimension of the hidden states here down to the dimension of uh, the number of class we have. Okay? So this pre trained model was pre trained during the pre training task, the pre training step. And this classifier model will be initialized from scratch and trained on our adaptation or fine tuning step. Okay? So we want this to be probably quite small because we want to be able to train it from scratch on a small data set. But as you can see, if it's just a linear projection from this dimension to this one, it's really quite simple, okay? It's really quite uh, data efficient, parameter efficient. And here is one example from the tutorial we gave last summer. So if you want to see the full code, and if you want to read and play with the code, just go to the, the slides link I showed you on the first, um, uh, on the first slide. And what you can see is that on this task, track six, 
which uh, as the name uh, suggests is a six class classification task. On this class, we have two main benefits. The first one is that after one epoch, we train it with, for one epoch here, we reach already over 90% accuracy. So it's very data efficient because this data set is quite small in terms of deep learning. It's 2000 example, 2500. So this is really something you could label yourself with a small team of, of a few people. You spend, you spend like a few hours and you can label 2000 example. And just one epoch on this, you see on Google Collab, it took one minute. <laughs> and you reach an accuracy of over 90%. And now the second great thing is that when we train it for three epochs, which is still quite, quite fast, we reach a error rate of 3.6, which at that time was the state of the art on this data set. So fine tuning is often um, leads to good performances. And yeah, in this case, it was even quite robust because the hyperparameter that we selected here was just directly taken from, from basic hyperparameter in the, um, in the literature. Okay, now a totally different task. So you can just see the wide uh, applicability of this uh, approach. This totally different task is dialogue generation. This is a task I found really fun. Uh, so let's take this example, which is the uh, data set called Persona Chat from Facebook, which is kind of fun. Here we have a little persona like uh, if you want a little knowledge base which describe the how uh, a chatbot is supposed to be so in this case it's an artist with four children who recently got a cat who likes to walk for, to exercise and to watch game of thrones and now we have a dialogue history so the chatbot is, is discussing with the user the user say hi and the chatbot answer hello how are you today and then the user say i'm good thank you how are you and the job of our model is to predict the next utterance. So here the gold answer from a, from a human will be great, thanks. My children and I were just about to watch Game of Thrones. So now you can see it's a bit more complex because we have a lot of different type of inputs. We have some knowledge base, we have a dialogue history, we have the last utterance from the user, and we even have the beginning of the reply because usually we generate the reply words by words. So we need to know what we have already generated to not keep generating the same word over and over. So we have like four types of inputs. And how do we input that in our model? So we have a, there's a, several ways to do that. We actually had a paper last year at ACL on this. Um, and uh, the simplest way is that you can just concatenate everything to build a single input sequence and you put that in your model. And that works. Actually, it works quite well. And the other option, as I show you two slides ago, is that you can duplicate the model in two different models. And then these two models, you can duplicate the pre-trained on part if you want, huh? you copy it. And you copy it in several models, which will be tasked with digesting each type of input. Okay? So this is another example. And what you can see is that it works really well. This is a competition. We participated uh, with Hugging Face now two years ago on this exact uh, example of persona chat and uh, on the automatic matrix we were uh, really above the other uh, the other type of models and i think it was one of the first time in this competition that transfer learning was used for dialogue generation okay so now in this uh, couple of slides i want to show you the trends and the limits of transfer learning in nlp Should I stop sometime to get some question? Let me check just a little bit. Uh, mm. Yeah, maybe I can take just a few questions. If I, up, can I keep the presentation and the question at the same time? Sure, sure. Um, maybe yeah. the first question that was asked was, what is the difference between fine tuning, transfer learning and pre-training? Mm, yeah, I think I answered a little bit, but I can give uh, back the the, the um, very high level summary. So uh, transfer learning is the whole thing where you, uh, let me put this 
back again full screen, that will be easier for you to see. So transfer learning is the whole thing, pre-training, pre-citation, is the whole, is the whole idea of using some like data which is not the data that you, uh, which is not limited to the data which was designed for your tasks. So the, the idea of going everywhere, gathering a, a bigger data set. So and transfer learning is the general ID and inside transfer learning, you have several steps of training the model. And these have the, the, the name of pre-training for the first step and adaptation or fine tuning for the second step. Okay. Yeah, I can go very quickly just over the question maybe myself to see if there is a few that makes sense. Can I explain what is happening between the, uh, Mikael asked, can I explain what is happening between the final hidden states and the final output is? Yeah, so the final hidden states is a vector. Um, where was my, uh, oh yeah, no, this one. The final hidden state is a vector and then you actually just project it down on the vocabulary. Uh, hopla. So here you have a vector. Uh, this is just a this is just a linear matrix if you want huh? the on the on this on this length this is the dimension of this vector and here this is the number of the um, words in the vocabulary so when you make the product you imagine this oh no you don't see my mouse let me put the pointer okay when you imagine this thing you put it back vertically here you do the the product the matrix product with this matrix you end up with a vector here and this vector is the length of your vocabulary. You take the highest number here, and it should be the, the number um, associated to the word is, okay? So each, each word, they have an index in the vocabulary, each word in your vocabulary. So you take the highest, and it should be is. So this is just a projection, okay? I take another one, and then I, and then I continue. Is it right that mask language model is kind of a SIBO model? Yeah. Yeah, it can be seen this way. I won't go uh, too deep because I don't know, uh, I didn't really cover SIBO and skip uh, and uh, basically where to vec, but yeah, this is a way to see it. And maybe a last one, is there a significant difference between mask language modeling and autoregressive modeling when fine-tuned on downstream task? Yes, there is a significant difference. And the difference is actually what I showed here, which is that, um, the mass language models, which is on the left here, they are inherently more powerful for some tasks because they can use the right context. So let's say, for instance, you're doing tagging, okay? So to each token in the input here, you will want to associate the tag. For instance, a tag which will say, dog is a noun, and is, let's say we have is here, is is a verb, okay? And here it's very nice to be able to look at the right context as well to disambiguate some words. For instance, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a good word, but if you have a word which could be, for instance, a noun and a verb, sometimes it's very easy to just look one or two words after to see if it's actually a noun or a verb. Like a bank, maybe is one of these words that can be a noun or a word, a noun, noun and a, or a verb. Yeah. So, for instance, for this task, the the mask language models with bi-directional attention are more powerful. But now another type of task is, for instance, generation. If you want to generate the next word, if you want to do just uh, context your generation, then it's very nice if your model has been trained to actually predict the next word because it's trained to do exactly this task of predicting the next word. Uh, so the GPT models, they are typically better for generation than the BERT. BERT, it's really hard to generate because if you mask the last word, usually the last word is like just a punctuation because you take full sentences usually. So if you take a basic BERT that was trained on full sentences, then it will always try to predict just the, the punctuation at the end. Okay. Yeah, then I will continue. And uh, in, uh, okay, last one. PDM is using a language model rather than a mask language model, only a computational advantage. Yeah, so this I, I kind of answered. And there is a trade-off. You have a computational advantage, but your model is less powerful for some kind of task. So now model, so now people actually mix the two. If you train an encode or decode, encode or decoder model, like a lot of recent model are, uh, like T5, like BART, this model, they have both in the same. 
So if you want more information on this, I actually recorded a very long video on, uh, on all these things, which is on our YouTube channel. So I post a few links after the run. You just apply a soft max of a vocabulary. Yeah, okay, well, okay, I will continue and then, uh, then, I will keep, then I will come back to the question. So we were at the trends and limits in NLP. Okay, so the first trend that you have probably noticed if you have been following a little bit the news is that the models, they are getting bigger and bigger. Well, they've always been big models. I mean, they've, they've, even in the past, there were already models that were uh, roughly uh, could be estimated as billion parameters. But right now, it's really, I mean, uh, necessary if you want to be in the benchmark. And it's actually the main central models. It's not exceptions anymore. It's just the main models that people are studying. They are very often bigger than one billion parameters. So there have been this recent trend in the last two years. BERT was maybe the first one to do that with uh, what they called BERT large and in the paper they said oh we are really exploring the largest uh, possible model with our 340 million parameter but just one year after we have models which are now um, three orders of magnitude bigger so OpenAI has been pushing with the GPT-2 was the first model kind of widely known to be above one billion parameter then there was Grover and then Megatron, Google. T5 was, was for some time the biggest one, 11 billion parameters. Then Microsoft did the Turing and GPT-3 this year. And right now the biggest one is the Google G Shard with 600 billion parameters. And they actually in this paper, they even trained a trillion parameter model. But I think they said there was some uh, instability during the training. So this is very, very big. And this caused some problems. What are the problems? Well, the first problem is that if you look at the benchmark, which are designed by academia people, like all the top spots, they're just Google, Baidu, Microsoft, Microsoft, Facebook. It's just a big team. It's just a big company who are able to train these models. Like academia cannot train anymore, this, this type of models. Some people do, like uh, Yei Jing Shui trained the, the Groover model, uh, but this is very rare and it's very difficult for them. So, one thing they do very well, I think right now, is try to analyze and to understand how these models work, which is also uh, a kind of super, super useful. But yeah, that's a, that's a problem. Another problem is environmental cost, because we know that uh, consuming so much computation, like uh, needing so much computation, generates a lot of energy consumption and then a lot of carbon dioxide. Okay. And the last big question is, is it actually a research program just getting bigger do we expect to see some magical phase transition to agi as, as francois Cholet say okay are we actually just trying to reach the moon by building a big scale or a big uh, skyscraper okay well what we should be doing instead would be to try something very different like building a rocket okay this is a very good question i think and so there is another trend that we've been trying to push at Huggy Face uh, in particular is to make this model smaller. So three main techniques have been investigating, investigated. Uh, the first one is distillation. Uh, we have a model, for instance, called Distill Bird that Victor uh, built. So, so in our team, it's really Victor who has been leading the, this type of experiments. And, and recently, Sam worked a little bit on that. But yeah, and they did a distillation where they discovered that, uh, Victor discovered that you can actually divide the size of bird by two and keep it most of the performances. And this year he's been experimenting with pruning, finding the right way to do pruning, which means you will, uh, instead of training a, a student model, you, can, you will remove weights from the teacher model and you can reach extreme sparsity regime where you just have one or two percent of the weights left and you still have most of the performances as well. The last possibility is to do quantization, where you will leave the float32 uh, domain to go into the integer domain. And you can actually combine these three ones, like in a nice paper uh, I was reading yesterday, actually called Fast Formers by Microsoft, where they do the three of them and they reach like, I think a 200 uh, X uh, speed up, like 200 times faster and a lot smaller. So this, is, this makes a lot of sense, I think. Now, outside of this computational question, there is more general question on the behavior of these models. 
we even though they are very big and they are better than the previous models we still see they are very brittle and they have some spuriousness so brittleness means that if you modify a bit the input text even when the meaning is preserved the model is very quickly lost so here for instance on squad this paper of uh, robin gia and persilian is kind of a, a seminal paper on this where they kind of modified a little bit the wikipedia articles that were used in the in the question answering uh, squad data set and the models that were trained on the original wikipedia were totally lost okay spuriousness is a little bit different spuriousness is the idea that if you have an easy way to try to guess the answer the model will go for this easy way but often the easy way is what we call an artifact or heuristics so here is a good example just to show you okay this is the task is called uh, entailment it's a task in the glue benchmark and the idea is that you have two sentences and the model should predict if one sentence contradicts the other or is entailed by the other or is neutral the two sentences have no relation okay and in in the the pre new to uh, the training data set here very often when uh, you have a lot of words in common between the two sentences then the correct label is entailment but sometimes this is this is plain wrong here in these examples you have these two type of sentence the doctor was paid by the actor and the, and the second sentence is the doctor paid the actor so you can see they mean the opposite thing in the first case is the doctor is the actor who is paying in the second case it's the doctor who is paying but they have a lot of words in common the word doctor the word actor the word paid and so the models they will uh, always predict this is entailment because they have learned on the training data set that when you have a lot of lexical overlap you should predict entailment but that's a shortcut that's a heuristic that we wouldn't want the model to learn we would want the model to learn the underlying to learn to try to guess the, the underlying meaning of the sentence and to do reasoning based on that okay so this is also a very nice adversarial data set by by thomas mccoy uh, which is called hans and the models are playing wrong on this they are almost zero accuracy now taking a step back again there is more general shortcoming of the fact that we are working on text and there is what we call the human reporting bias we say that uh, we are not stating the obvious if something is obvious usually we don't write it so i, I very often take the, the example of the color of a sheep we very often say that sheep are white are white the animals the animal sheep are white because because everybody knows that okay we just don't have to write it but we talk a lot about the black sheep because the black sheep are way an expression in english okay and so when you ask these models when you ask gpt or bird what color is a sheep they are lost they are not sure they're like oh, maybe black <laughs> but this is wrong and the, the the idea is basically that when something is in common sense we don't write it down because it's boring so there is stuff that are just missing from text and the way we could overcome that is actually to step back from text only and to try to add something so it could be a database where we would connect sheep with color white for instance it could be an image of a field where you see some sheep eating grass and then the model will say oh yeah i see the color on the image or it can be a human in the loop like we talk to our babies to our kids we say no this is wrong it's this okay but this all kind of evolved uh moving a little bit away from pure text and the last limits i want to showcase today is called continual learning and the examples i like to take here is that gpt3 was very expensive to train as we all know but it was trained just before covid and so it has just no idea of what covid is and that's very stupid because today it is such a strong um, elements defining our daily life okay and it's very hard to add a new data set it's very hard to add a new knowledge to these models because we face what is called catastrophic forget forgetting when you try to add new knowledge they forget other things so there is no very good solution to this but there is some people who are trying like including us who are trying to add some kind of database to this model which is a good way to have something you could update 
Okay, now in the second part of this talk, uh, I'm kind of finished with the, I'm a bit slower, I'm definitely a lot slower than what I should be, so I should go faster. And uh, the second part of this talk, I will talk about Huggy Face, what we do on our library. So I go a bit faster and then show you more in the question maybe. So Huggy Face, what we do is we try to democratize NLP. So we've always liked the creativity, all the generational capacity of the new AI model. We thought it was really fun to interact with. It was interesting for, from an artistic point of view as well, to have this model who could generate text, who could generate images. And so the first product we had was a chatbot, actually. And while we were developing these products, we open sourced a few tools which got uh, actually very quickly adopted by the community and uh, which kind of after some times we were spending basically all our times working on the open source tools. And so last year we pivoted to fully dedicate ourselves to uh, accelerating and basically catalyzing the research in NLP and, and uh, AI in general by, by doing some open source and just doing more sharing of everything. So the sharing we do take two main forms. The first one is knowledge sharing. This is why I'm, I'm here talking today and we organize workshop with other people from the academia and other, uh, other company. We organize conferences, tutorial. <coughs> and the other thing, the second aspect is probably what you know more is code sharing. We think code and model sharing is one way to basically make people stand on the shoulder of giants and just basically fuel the uh, current AI and NLP revolution, <clears throat> okay? We like to break barriers between everything, between researcher, practitioner, between frameworks, PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX. We like to make it easy for everyone to use all these things, basically, without the what we think are artificial barriers between all these communities. So we have three main libraries today. The first one, which is the most famous, is called Transformers. Transformers is a library of state-of-the-art general purpose uh, tools. So it's a way to easily share uh, models, basically pre-trained models, okay? It's made to be super easy to use, super fast to onboard. I, I hope it was your experience when you played with it. It's made to be accessible to everyone, even though it started as a library for researchers. So we do have a, a little bit of a high level of uh, uh, expectation that you have, for instance, read the papers of, of the model that you are using, uh, but we're trying to, to lower the entry, entry barrier. And more and more it's used also by practitioner, just because, uh, yeah, it works. And we provide state-of-the-art models, so we, we try to guarantee that they reproduce the performances of the original publication. And there is, as, as I told you, there's deep interoperability between all the framework. Now we also have JAX through the, the Flax library. We're starting to add support for that as well. This is an overview of all the architecture and it's actually quite out of date. We have a lot more architecture today, but you, you can recognize all the models we've been talking about, BERT, the GPT family, Roberta, which is a nice model from Facebook, T5, which is very big, but uh, very nice, uh, multilingual model, XL Roberta, Alex Icono's work is really nice uh, on multilinguality. Uh, BART is an encoder decoder. We have a model for dialogue. <coughs> a lot of different type of model. Even multi multi-model models, we start to have one. MMBT is one, and we have an Elix Mert, which is not uh, in this list, but yeah. It's very easy to use. We can talk about that maybe in the question. And we have also, uh, so this is the GitHub, as I told you, it's all open source. And we have also now a model hub where we actually have the official models, but also community provided model. It's very easy to upload your model. And so you can add yours. And the nice thing is that people have been adding models in many languages. So originally, because all these big companies, they are mostly uh, English speaking, we have a lot of English models, but like for instance, um, Spanish, French models, you can see that there is a lot of models that were uploaded by the community. There's also translation models. And if you go, you can also directly play with the model here. You can see how they behave directly on the website. Uh, so all this is at huggingface.co. This is the model hub. Um, it's a very nice thing. Now the second library is called tokenizer. So we've developed tokenizer because we discovered that the tokenization process, this process I, I, that I showed you in the first part of converting strings, in sequence of integers, this process was actually very slow in Python because you have a lot of for loops and Python doesn't look like for loops. 
So uh, Anthony uh, in our team t t took the, the challenge of uh, rewriting that in a fast language. So he selected Rust, which is really fast and very safe and very efficient. And so we have nice this library called Tokenizer, where you can have just basically all the tokenizer we are using to split the word, VPE, byte level, word level, sentence space, all that in Python, JS, and Rust. So you can uh, access it through the standard way to access uh, Python, JS, Rust way. And it's very fast. And then just before the summer, we open sourced a third library, which is called Dataset. And here the idea was that a bit like the model, we thought it was really aha uh -huh, to access some public data sets. We thought you, you, you keep writing the same pre-processing code, you keep downloading from the same URL and writing the same extracting thing. And so we thought maybe we should do just like the models, just one line and then you get this uh, data set that you are always using. And this also help us make the examples to use transformer a lot simpler to write, which is nice. And so we decided to make this data set library and also to include some metrics because some metrics, for instance, for natural language generation, they can be quite complex now. They can involve a neural net pre-trained that will be used to evaluate the metrics. So we thought it would be nice to also have them as a one-liner installation. And the nice thing about this that library is, uh, so we have a lot of data set already, uh, more than actually this is also out of date. We have more than that. It's uh, as always for us, it's kind of framework agnostic. It's designed to work with NumPy, Pantas, PyTorch, TensorFlow. And the cool thing is that we really focus on make it super fast and super efficient. So there is a backend, which is powered by Apache Arrow, which is really fast, even for super large data set and really mem memory efficient. So for instance, you can process load work on Wikipedia, which is a uh, hating, Hundred uh, hiding gigabytes data set, so pretty big. You can work on it just with nine nine megabytes of RAM. And it's work really fast. So this is a cool library as well. You can check it out. And now, yeah, yeah, this is code example just to show you how easy it is. So here, yeah, I should update it. It used to be called NLP. Now it's called data set because we uh, already have some image and multimodal data set that people have, uh, have added. Uh, but um, here is to show you how easy to you is it to prepare like a standard data set, standard benchmark data set like the MRPC uh, subset of GLU. Uh, GLU is a, is a benchmark data set with nine nine subsets, I think. And so MRPC is one, one of these subsets. So you just load the data set with load data set. And this data set is like a Python container. Like it's like a dictionary, basically. Um, so it's very easy to access, but it's really fast because it's a dictionary that's basically directly powered by a fast C, C, uh, C backend. And you can tokenize it with the tokenizer from Transformer. You just define the tokenization function as, as you want and you map it on the data set. And there it is. And if you want to put it in a PyTorch data loader, I told you it's uh, compatible with PyTorch. So you just take the data loader, you put the data set in it. And here we put a collate function ourselves because we want to do dynamic padding. So we want to pad each badge to the longest sentence. So we use tokenizer.pad as the collate. And this is the all, um, how many is it? Like 15 lines you need to prepare the PyTorch data loader with glue. Okay, with the tokenized, tokenized data set. So it's very fast and you, and you see the, all, everything is visible. You see how the tokenization behave, how you design your padding, everything is customizable. So I'm really happy about this thing. You can check it out here. We also have a hub where you can uh, see the data set and you can even explore them. You click on browse and in your browser, you can explore this data set. This is book corpus, for instance, a data set of uh, one, I don't know, maybe four, four gigabytes of books. But yeah, uh, you have a lot of, um, we have a nice hub for this as well. So this is also at huggingface.co, it's the same hub. Okay, so I think I need my 40 minutes. So usually here, the last thing, and maybe I can finish on that, is to show you the main resources and then I will take the, the question. So the main resources to start from the library, there are two main things. You have the GitHub, where you will want to go on a hugging face transformers. Oops. Transformer, yeah, usually go on pull request, but that's. So here, um, 
we have two nice places to start. One nice place is, well, obviously there is the documentation, which is a good place to start because now we have a quick tool, which is very really nice to walk you through the library. And we have all these usage guides. So if you read all these usage guide, there are a few of them, you will know everything about how to do tokenization, how to do training, fine tuning, and how to share your model. And you have a lot of summaries if you're a bit lost. So, so this is a good place to start, but if you're more like a code person, you can start by the notebooks, which are in notebooks. And they're organized. We have a few notebooks that we designed ourselves, and then the community keep adding some notebooks. So you, can, you may find the, the right one that you actually want. If you, let's say you actually want to use this bird for classification, you can just look at what uh, Davo did. So this is a nice thing. And then the third place, if you're not into notebooks, but more into Python scripts, for instance, you should go in the examples where we have some scripts for many tasks. Like you just select your task. Let's say you want to do um, text classification. You can go there. And um, yeah, here you have examples for various ways you can do if you want to use TensorFlow, you can go to the TensorFlow glue, okay? So this is the example, the code thing. And then the last part is um, the, other, the other entry point is huggingface.co is the model hub. So this is, oh, right, this is hidden behind the, yeah, hugging face just has 3G juke. And here there is a few nice things. So you have to click on this um, menu here. There is all the doc that you find again. There is the model that I showed you. Uh, so if, you, if you're looking for a birth model, oops, it's a bit slow. Birth base encased here. You can play with the model directly here. Yeah, you see it's active. Here we have, you can see how it behaves with this mask. Paris is the mask of France, the model we guess its capital. So this is uh, directly live. And uh, you have model cards where people explain what the model do, the limitation, the biases, the training data, training procedure. So you have a lot of information you can use, visualize, but this I will explain you. And then the other thing I wanted to show you is our blog and forum. Forum I'll show you later, but the blog, we have a lot of very nice demo. Um, for instance, RAG we opened source recently is a retrieval augmented model. So here you can play with it and you can try to understand how it works, how it behave. And we have a lot of demo like this. So check the blog. Uh, sometimes it's a long explication. Patrick is very good to uh, make very clear explanation, but sometimes it's also just a very nice demo that you can play with. Like this is another demo by Joe on zero shot classification. Okay. And now, um, yeah, I think I can take some questions then. Hello. Should I maybe just continue? Yeah, I yeah, can maybe. some questions for you, up, up to you if you... You want to select them as you want, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so somebody mentioned that um, going back to um, maybe the more theoretical part, um, the use of adapter modules to overcome catastrophic forgetting. Um, alors, the use of adapter module, yeah, I did not cover that, that's right. So this is covered in app transfer learning. Yeah, one thing I can show you, actually, I will probably spend a lot of questions just pointing you to additional material. I think it's probably the most efficient way. So one thing you can do is uh, on YouTube, go on our channel. We have just one video. <laughs> we should do more, but it's a long one, but it's nice. It's on the future of natural language processing, if you want to look at it. And I cover adapter and things like that. So this is one way. Another way is the link actually that I showed you on the first slide. Uh, we have also a long, when we did, the tutorial last year we have this uh, we did this long part on adapters as well so this is a good resource and now there is also a small library called adapter hub which is uh, i think a little bit what we do uh, we are not we are not related to to them but they, they build um, 
Uh, yeah, of course, if I tap adapter, um, uh, I have like so many, but you can check it out. Uh, it's a good um, place to find. Ah, yeah, this is adapter hub. And they provide adapter. So just a high level overview for people who don't know what is adapter. So usually when you train your model, you have a lot of parameters. And sometime when you, let me, sh let me just, yeah, stop the sh sharing. When you train the model, you have all these parameters and it's quite computationally intensive to train all the models. So um, when you're doing the fine tuning, an alternative step to fine tune the whole model is to add some play, some little neural network if you want inside the model and you will just fine tune this small uh, adapter part. So the, the transform model, model, you remember there was this, this one like high, big hyper column uh, so it's a, like a quite a linear, like linear type of model. So you can just put inside these adapters. You can just put them uh, as they usually as are like little bottleneck or, or reverse bottleneck. How you call that? I don't know. And so you just fine tune them. Now, if you want to do them to use them for continual learning, that's a good idea to try to avoid uh, catastrophic forgetting. Yeah. So I think there was a recent paper on this. Can, I can maybe can find and then I can post the link. That's probably the easier thing. But it's quite experimental. Uh, personally, I'm not sure it will solve everything. Yeah, I think for me, the most interesting thing to overcome uh, continual learning is more the RAG type of model. So I can, yeah, if you want, I can show you a little more, but you can also, you've seen probably on this, uh, I show you on the demo, we have a demo on the RAG model. And this model has a database actually that's, that it creates itself and you can update the database. The database is kind of a way to embed the training set in the model. So for instance, if you have an old version of Wikipedia that was embedded as training set, you can just update it to a new version of Wikipedia and then you have uh, updated the knowledge of your model. So it's quite interesting. We have a few questions that are more in the applied direction. So you said that initially it was more targeted towards research, but it's also going in, you know, the direction of, of practitioners and, um, and industry. So we have a couple of questions um, regarding that, for example, um, have these large scale pre-trained uh, models and fine tuning techniques um, have they found its way into industry, into deployment for different use cases? And uh, specifically one question that, you know, it seems very promising, but do companies then depend on, um, or, or, or other uh, practitioners generally depend on these large corporations that own these models or train these models? And how does Hugging Face, um, yeah, tackle yeah, that? So I think, yeah, we have to bear in mind that these models, they are just like one year old uh, for most of them. So I think already it's, it's very fast for like practitioners who already been using this, this type of uh, state of the art research. Uh, I come from physics where you usually have a, a 10 line, a 10 years difference between having an idea and being able to use it in, in practical products. So I think sometimes people are just overly uh, go a bit too fast. Huh? You 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 should wait a little bit. But but very definitely, BERT is now used in in a lot of products. Um, for instance, the, just as embeddings as well. Just like for instance, Google Search use a version of BERT in its search bar. Microsoft also use that in Microsoft Bing. And uh, as pre-processing step, just to digest and to obtain good representation of the words. It's, it's very clearly uh, this method which are, which are more powerful today. Now, do we depend on big corporation? I don't think so, because uh, one of the great thing about AI, I think the, the current revolution of AI is that we have this notion of sharing a lot. This is actually something we, we do push a lot, which means you can just use this model and they are open so you, you don't really, well, except for GPT-3. So this is actually, <laughs> this is obviously, a development we are not very, uh, which doesn't really um, match the, the value we try to promote at Hugging Face, I could say maybe, uh, where you will depend on them because you don't have access to the model, but the BERT and the Roberta, if you use, for instance, transformers, you just download them on your, on your, on your computer and then you have them. It's just 
you don't really have anything to to do with um, anything to pay to big companies. But there's also some very open question of licensing. That this, this this model train on some kind of license data, for instance, copyrighted data. Are the are the model should the model be distributed or not? Right now, I think it's very much not clear in terms of um, like pretty much all question related to licensing on AI. That's the thing that AI product and the, the text that some AI product is it does it belong to somebody or not? It's very not clear, I think. So yeah, yeah no. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can take one or two more questions. I'll just summarize a few because we had a few that are going into the same direction. So one or a couple of were directed towards limitations of NLP, for example, causality and reasoning. I think you addressed in your talk um, where the problems are. Another would be explainability and interpretability. Is Hugging Face um, planning on doing something in that direction? Yeah, that's a good point, definitely. So, um... One, one good thing I can show you just a little bit, but we, we want to do more about this. We think this is very important. I mean, our, our main goal is try to, to actually push the field in the in direction that we think are beneficial for everybody and interpretability. We think it's a direction which is beneficial to everybody. Like efficiency is another direction and sharing is, is all direction we think are just important for the community. And so interpretability is something we'd like to push. So for instance, if you go on the model hub, um, can, can you see? Yeah, we see, you can see my, my page. Huh? If you go on the model, have some models have a beginning of thing that was built by Hendrik uh, at uh, MIT, Harvard, IBM. And if you go here, you have an expert where you can actually see a little bit what's happening in this model. So I think one nice thing about transformers and one of the like founding ideas of this thing was to give access to this model but also to give access to the internal of this model what is happening inside the model so people can try to start to understand what's happening inside the model so we've always been very careful to make the code very accessible make the weights very accessible make it easy to tweak the code to extract more information if you need and so they actually build this thing which is called expert that we have now uh, also integrated where you can see how for instance the action tension between some words behave so you can type in your your sentence here and you can see uh, what the model pay attention to so i mean it's still very uh, heavy to digest you need to be uh, to understand how these models work to be able to use this thing but i think this is one step further and another thing we are also for for instance very interesting is connecting more these models to the data set they were trained on because if you want to understand the prediction of this model it's very useful to be able to relate it to the data they were trained on and even the specific data example they were trained on so for instance if um if BERT is like predicting this, or we can take, there is some example here, let's say uh, the, the man, um, the man worked as a, let's take this one, I want to show you. Huh? This, this is an example of bias, for instance. You see, you have all this thing, okay? Uh, the man worked as a carpenter, waiter, barber mechanism. And if we say the woman, we have nurse, waitress, maid, prostitute, cook. Okay. These are horrible predictions, prostitute. This is just ugly that it's in the top four. This is a clear example of bias. Uh, how can you, well, there are many ways you can investigate bias and there are many ways it can arise in the model, but one way is in the data. You can look at the training data set and see what are the related data points and why should we find prostitute as a possible here, okay? And so we want to try to connect that basically uh, using the fact that we also host data set now. And so we should have an, a way to connect these two and to help you see, oh, okay, I'm using this Roberta model. It's failing on my use case or it's having this huge bias that I don't want in my, in my product because I want a, a nice product that does not predict prostitutes for women. So, um, but you and the way to understand that is to let you extract the training examples for instance that are the closest and so to, to understand if you can also remove them that would be the next step but the first step is to try to understand better where it comes from so these are examples uh, i mean there are many things this is really one thing i really want to push so i can talk about <laughs> i can talk for three hours on this great thank you and maybe the last question because we're almost out of time um 
we're an open source community. I think you have a lot of open source contributors. Uh, you, you talked briefly about the hub. Um, what would be like the best way to get, uh, you know, to support um, and to make open source contributions to Hugging Face? Yeah, that's a very good question. So yeah, just actually just one thing because uh, the discussion doesn't have to stop here. We have now a nice forum, which is at discuss.huggingface.co. And so here, it's really a place to foster discussion. It's very active, actually. Well, there's a lot of people asking just questions about transformers and how they can work on this on their thing. But you have a lot of also possibility to ask other type of questions. So, if I did not answer your question here, you just you can just come here and you can tag me, and I'm here. And if you forget where is the forum, you just go on our main website and you go on the menu and there is the forum here and it's the same place. So this is a good place to discuss and actually also to propose ideas if you want to uh, propose some, yeah, um, collaboration. We, we actually also, we, we've started and we want to do that more. We've started to post uh, I'm not sure if I can find, but to post kind of request for help. We say, okay, there is this nice thing to do, but we are just like four of us on the on working on the on the library. So if you want to help, you can start working on that. So we've started to post a little bit things about that um, on the forum or obviously uh, on the GitHub. So you will want to go uh, on the GitHub. Well, now I have all this. Um, things hiding my URL bar. Okay, here it is. And here we have some label of good first issue. We, we want to do that more. It takes actually some time just to uh, think about what is a good first issue, but we have tried to add a few of them. Uh, so this is a good place. Um, yeah, for instance, Lisan had some documentation. Uh, we do miss some tons of flow thing. We, we have a we are a little bit behind on, on TensorFlow. Uh, so yeah, so this is also a good thing. If you want to contribute, you can, uh, yeah, you can also just post uh, on the on the forum, say, okay, I would like to help, what is, what is nice, I like to do that and that and that. And if you want to contribute, obviously you want to read, but this you will see, you want to read the contributing, read me, which is a good way also to, to, to start and to see. One thing we will add, uh, yeah, that's a good question and maybe if you have a way to feedback here, we would like to add a very simple way. And I, I was playing with that this morning for people to add new models because up to now we've been the only one adding new architecture, but we think this is uh, this should be simple. So we've had a new model, a new tool that actually does, um, it builds a whole template for you, which pass the test. I mean, the main tricky part usually is to pass the whole the whole test suite but this builds a whole term page which is ready and you just change like the attention to fit with the models you want to uh, to add well when i say add new models i mean models that were published by a researcher recently where they open source the weights and the code and you think it would be nice to have it in the in the transformer framework so this is something we are adding uh, right now if you think it's a good idea you can just post in the conversation here say okay i would like to, i think i would be ready to add the new models uh, if there was a, an easy way to do it it will still take i think to i mean okay three to four hours to add a new model because you need to take the, the, the weights from the original thing to try to check everything's working well. So this is still a, a significant involvement, but this is, this is, I think, something very nice if the company, if the community want to help on that. 